I'm the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. I want to welcome you to the fourth lecture in this series of five on the science of evolution. There will be one more lecture after this one. It'll be two weeks from tonight on May 28th, uh, and we're ending this thing with a big bang. Uh, Dr. Barham Mobosher is an astrophysicist. That's pretty corny, isn't it? <clears throat> we'll give a lecture entitled, Let There Be Light, the first billion years, in which he will talk about the evolution of the universe beginning with the Big Bang. Let me remind you that that lecture will not be held in this lecture theater. Instead, it will be held um, in a building called the University Lecture Hall, Lecture Hall 1000. Uh, some of the earlier advertising about this series uh, suggested that the lecture would be in the, the physics lecture hall, but it, it won't be. Uh, it's in the, in the University Lecture Hall. You can look it up on the, on the uh, campus map, or there will be signage uh, around the campus as there uh, have been for these other ones. So you can find your way to that lecture hall, I think, fairly easily. I just want to alert you that it will not be here. So after that last lecture, uh, we're going to have a reception in the courtyard outside the building. Won't be anything fancy. Uh, we want to have lemonade and cookies and invite you to stay around uh, to talk with the speakers. All but one of the lecturers will be there. Uh, uh, Marlene Zuck, unfortunately for us, will not be there. She'll be uh, out of town. Uh, but we're looking forward to, to talking with you after that lecture, if you would like. Also at the next lecture, we'll be announcing uh, the topic, and I hope the schedule for next year's lecture series uh, has a little bit of planning to be done between now and then, and hopefully we can get it done. Uh, I also want uh, at, the, at this time to acknowledge the teachers who've been coming to these lectures, the people who teach our kids uh, in the school system. So if there are teachers here tonight, would you please stand up and let us all recognize you and thank you for what you do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, what you do really is, is a part of what we do. Uh, it's a continuum and it, you're a vital part of the process and thank you very much for what you do. Um, I also want to remind you that, um, uh, uh, and, uh, that this lecture series is hosted and sponsored by the Science Circle. Uh, the members of the Science Circle uh, have uh, helped us financially and organizationally in putting this series together, and I want to thank them as well. We're hoping that the ranks of the members of the Science Circle will grow and, uh, as, as we move forward with this series. I also want to thank everyone who comes to this series uh, because it really is a very encouraging to the faculty to realize that what we do uh, is indeed of interest to the broader public. Uh, I would say with um, some pride that when I talked to the faculty at the very beginning, told them that people would indeed be interested in these lectures. Some of them said, oh, nobody will come. But this is a very, very um, pleasing and exciting for us to see the interest that you have in science. So tonight's lecture is entitled Life's Rocky Road, The History of Life on Earth. It's presented by Dr. Nigel Hughes. Dr. Hughes is a geologist and a paleontologist who specializes in invertebrate paleontology. Paleontology is the study of forms of life existing in earlier geologic periods as represented by their fossils. Invertebrate means without a backbone, and this word covers a large number of different organisms, including worms, insects, animals with a shell like clams and jellyfish. The invertebrates people uh, tend to think to be most familiar with have an exoskeleton such as insects and other arthropods. Nigel Hughes is an internationally recognized expert in trilobites, which is a class of arthropods that flourished worldwide for about 300 million years. Because of their exoskeleton fossilized, which fossilizes very easily, trilobite fossils are very common and for that reason have been very useful in providing evidence for scientists in several different fields. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about trilobites tonight. 
Dr. Hughes was born in the United Kingdom, received his bachelor's degree from the University of Durham, his PhD from the University of Brist Bristol, both in geology. In addition, he received a certificate in the uh, Bengali language from the University of Visva Bharati in the Indian state of West Bengal. He held positions in Ireland, Australia, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Cincinnati Museum Center before joining the UCR faculty in 1997. He enjoys field work in Asia and is presently completing his second substantial monograph on fossil trilobites from the Himalayan mountains. He's traveled and lectured widely and has published a large number of monographs, book chapters, and research papers. He is a member of a number of professional organizations and is a fellow of both the Geological Society of India and the Paleontological Society of India. His most remarkable achievement, however, is the Award of Excellence that he received in the, 19, in the 2004 Farmer John's Everything Better Wrapped in Bacon. <laughs> it's a recipe uh, for floating Welsh rabbit or leeks and cheese with bacon. I won't read the recipe, but I understand it's a family favorite. It seems that Dr. Hughes is an accomplished cook in addition to being a con an accomplished scientist. And I happen to have here a copy of that award. <laughs> Nigel, I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> Nigel Hughes. Thank you. I have one thing to say. Everything's better wrapped in bacon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, from the moment I open my mouth, uh, you can tell something about me, and that is, of course, that I am not originally from this country. And one of the things I wanted to just say at the beginning is what a remarkable opportunity it is for many of us who come from foreign countries to work in and, and live in this country. We really are tremendously grateful. It is an extraordinary country to live and, and, and do science in, and we're profoundly grateful for that opportunity. Also, very happy to be here in Riverside. Mary, uh, my wife, and I have lived here for 11 years. We have two children in public schools uh, here in, in Riverside. Um, uh, and uh, many of our friends from the community are here tonight. And the, the nicest thing about this lecture series is the possibility of inviting people who are not normally on campus to the University of California. So a special welcome, welcome to you, and thank you very much for coming. And I only hope I can give a lecture that uh, everybody gets uh, something from. So, uh, when we think in the, oh, I better put the uh, transfer to this, haven't I? So when we think in the, uh, in the public media about um, evolution, uh, it's often fossils that, uh, that come to the fore. Ooh, I seem to be stuck in an endless loop of Tom's. <laughs> We're really very grateful to the people who are. <laughs> Ah, here's something. Yes, here we go. Oh. <laughs> uh, so when we, when we hear about uh, um, evolu in, evolution in the popular media, we're often thinking about fossils. Uh, and yet, um, if you came to David's very eloquent lecture two weeks ago uh, about the first four chapters of The Origin of Species, uh, fossils really didn't get a very big look in. In fact, in the first edition of The Origin of Species, it's not until chapters 9 and 10 that the fossil record is mentioned in extensive detail. And that's after uh, two chapters on such esoteric topics as hybridization and instinct. So why was this? Why, when the, the, you know, the public view of evolution is, is paleontology, why did Darwin put it in that place? Was it because he didn't know much about paleontology? Well, of course, if you came to David's talk, you'll know that that, uh, that certainly wasn't the case. He was a very accomplished paleontologist. In fact, he cut his teeth in paleontology. In the uh, 1835 uh, Red Notebook, uh, he wrote a, a beautiful phrase about his attitude to geology, uh, which I've remembered, and uh, I will try and do it in my best PBS uh, Victorian uh, British uh, impersonation. He said that, uh, Geology is a capital science to begin with. It requires nothing but a little thinking, hammering, and reading. So obviously he was very into geology. Now, uh, 
in these days of specialization, we try and uh, uh, you know, get into a field very early. This is my uh, first uh, uh, forays on Cambrian rocks. Uh, I've been having uh, uh, trouble with my trouser suspensions ever since that, uh, since that time. Um, but uh, unlike my esteemed colleagues who've spoken in this series before me, um, I, uh, I got stuck in geology. I didn't move on to other areas of, uh, of, of biology. Uh, here I am in, in the Himalayas uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, that's a pencil. It's not actually marijuana that I'm uh, smoking at there. But uh, uh, anyway, um, uh, that's... <laughs> so uh, the point is, anyway, that Darwin um, was a very accomplished geologist. So why the placement of the discussion of the fossil record there? Well, Darwin knew that his theory was all or nothing. It had to explain all aspects of evolution or none of them. But he also knew, and David said this, that in order to explain evolution, it wasn't just a case of explaining a pattern. It was proposing a process that would drive that pattern. And that's what he describes in the first chapters um, of The Origin of Species. He was, though, very mindful about the nature of the fossil record, and he wrote extensively about it. And sometimes people wonder, you know, when you think of a popular image of a scientist, it's somebody in a lab and they're doing an experiment and they can repeat the experiment and all these kinds of things. And people sometimes ask, you know, how can we know anything about the past? Um, you know, we can't do an experiment on it. So the methodology that we use for doing that is just what a detective uses if a crime is not witnessed or caught on CCD a camera. We, we reconstruct from what's left behind what's happened in the past. And just to give a very simple, straightforward, uh, uh, familiar example of that. Uh, so here's one of our magnificent sequoias. And if we take a boring into the, the sequoia tree, we can see tree rings. Everybody knows tree rings, right? We could start off in one year and do a boring and come back a year later and do another boring and find that the tree has added one ring. Uh, as Larkin wrote, the yearly trick of looking new is written down in rings of grain, tree rings. So we can establish that uh, growth here and then slower growth at this period. So we can actually empirically see that. And David mentioned uh, two weeks ago, the key to understanding the past is the present. We can observe things that are going on in the present and use those to understand events that have occurred in the past. So since one tree ring is la laid down in a year and we can witness that through our borings, we can make... Uh, the inference that these indeed represent, also represent annual cycles. So the present is the key to the past, but the past has information of its own. For example, you can see that this year, two years ago, not a great year for the growth of this tree. On the other hand, this one here is very thick, so a, a better year. So it's not only are we able to say that these are tree rings, but we're actually seeing a pattern of change through time recorded. And this is the kind of methodology we use to uh, understand what's going on in the past. Well, this is a living tree. I mean, we obviously have records for the climate of these years. But can we see this kind of thing represented in the geological record, in the rock record? Well, we can, and even better. Now, this is going to look like a very boring slide, but this was the principal geological experience of my life. Okay, so here we are in a very boring wet quarry in the heart of England, a long, long way from the ocean. Uh, about 20 years ago, I took this, and you can see in this slide here, rock beds that are laid down. It's a sandy bed. You can see those layers. But you might be able to see, if you look carefully, that there's a kind of a fabric that is coming across that. Can you see those cross sets? cross beds that are occurring there. It's as if somebody has brushed that surface. What these represent is layers of sand, and then on top of the layer of sand is a little layer of mud, and then there's another layer of sand, and then there's a little, another layer of mud. And if we measure the thicknesses of these layers of sand, we find that they thicken, and then they thinnen, and then they thicken, and then they thin. And the cycle that they comprise is 28 layers. There are 28 layers from the thickest to the next thickest. So if we're thinking about a process that might generate layers on a scale of 28, what might that be? Well, I'm sure that's occurred to many of you. It is uh, a process which could explain this pattern on a 28 cycle, including thickening and thinning, would be the tidal cycle, right? The moon moves around the Earth in a 28-day uh, cycle. And when it's aligned with the sun, we get a really strong tide, so we get a thick layer. And when it's uh, at 90 degrees to the sun, we get a thinner layer. 
And that's exactly the pattern that we're seeing. So these are, are rocks, ancient rocks, but we see a resolution here which is actually even better. These are individual days that we're seeing in the geological record. It's an absolutely astonishing thing. Even more than that, though, because the Earth rotates around the Sun in an elliptical axis, when uh, the Earth is closest to the Sun, the tides are even stronger. And when it's further away from the sun, the tides are weaker. So the thicknesses of those packages vary in a systematic way. And we can resolve individual days, individual lunar months, solar years, etc., in that quarry. So remarkable resolution is possible in the geological record, and we can see that. But I've told you nothing so far about the actual age of these rocks. So how do we go about knowing what age these rocks are? There's nothing in this particular series of, oh, I should just mention what this actually represents. So this is, of course, the effect of tides. And the setting was a tidal setting. There are sand dunes migrating across a tidal flat. And as the, as the tide comes in, sand is taken from the back of the dune and tipped down the front. And then when the tide is high, the mud falls along the front of the dune, and it drapes that. And then the next tide comes in. And that's really what this is representing. So astonishing preservation. But we don't know about the ages of these rocks. So how do we tell? Well, there's nothing actually in those rocks to tell us the uh, relative age of those rocks. But the way in which we do it is the fact that uh, here are these rocks. They're in the heart of England. They're not lying at the top. They're not something that's happened in human history. In fact, they're under, uh, overlain with this funny angular uh, relationship by these rocks here lying on top. And these have fossils in. And so do the rocks below. They also have fossils in. And the principal way in which we tell the time of the rock, the age of the rock, is from the fossils that they contain. The primary way for most sedimentary rocks, most rocks formed in this kind of series. So how does that work? Well, uh, Tom mentioned I work on trilobites. This is the only discussion of trilobites in this talk. Here is a, a trilobite. They're an organic form, of course. They have a complex morphology. And that co complex morphology changes through time. This change through time was recognized long before Darwin. The fact is that various rock sequences are characterized by particular forms of life, by particular fossils that occur in sequence. And it works like this. So here are some beds uh, of rock. Here's a succession, something like the Grand Canyon. A certain layer of rocks here is the, is the layer that contains trilobites. We might go a little bit higher and find exactly the same kind of environment, the same water depth, et cetera, et cetera, but no trilobites anymore. In there, we have, say, snails, for example. And so there is a regular sequence that we can correlate amongst sections and around the world. And this sequence of occurrence was established long prior to Darwin's proposition of the origin of species and the idea of evolution. It's an empirical fact, this order of succession. So here, and I don't expect you to read this in any detail at all, <laughs> is a geological column that was established prior to the publication of the origin of species. You might be able to see a few words like uh, uh, fish down here, etc. There's order of occurrence. And these are the different rocks that bear these fossils that are named here. And this sequence is established prior to evolution. And despite 150 years' worth of work, this sequence and this uh, names of these units has persisted because it is the right sequence. It is absolutely empirically found. So different rocks characterized by different fossils. As Darwin noticed, as we go towards the top, we get more and more things that are still living today. That's the result of evolution. But it was proposed, it's a fact, prior to the proposition of evolution. Now, that tells us that the rocks with those tidal cycles in uh, are Cretaceous rocks. But it does not tell us what the age of those rocks are. Now, I would like to tell you about uh, the principles of radioisotopic dating. But if I do that, we don't get into the main story. I have a set of slides, and at the end, if anybody's interested to talk about this issue, we can. But I simply don't have time to go into that uh, uh, procedure. It's a fascinating story, and it's corroborated independently by other methods, including some of those beautiful tidal cycles. But anyway, the point is that various versions of elements undergo radioisotopic decay. 
Whatever we throw at these things, we cannot change the rate that we observe in the lab. And we are confident that these rates held constant through time because nothing we can do to these atoms changes the nucleus in the center. Everything we do when we squeeze them and heat them affects the electron cloud on the outside. So the rate of decay can provide a calibration for us which gives us a time in absolute time, a, a, a age in years, a measured age in years. And lo and behold, when we do that using this clock that gives an absolute date, and we look at the sequence that occurs, it corresponds remarkably well with the sequence that we get from the order of the occurrence of the fossils. And one of the things I really want to make the point about today as we discuss various topics is that an idea is really good when multiple lines of evidence independently converge on the same solution. So, that's the uh, story of the uh, radioisotopic dating. And it tells us that the age of the Earth is 4,600 million years ago. Now, what does that mean? It's a very difficult thing for us to conceive. So I need my helpers, please. Emily, uh, and, uh, Ian, and Kyra, and Sebastian. Yes, great. Can you come up here? We have a task to do. You see, I mentioned that number, 4,600 and uh, um, million, and uh, it comes off my tongue very glibly. But it's very difficult for us to really conceive of what that means. So when you're under stress, you should always have toilet paper handy, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to represent um, the uh, entirety of geological time by a, a strip of toilet paper that is 46 feet long. So Emily, if you could just take this down here. Now you walk over there till the, till the end of the thing. Don't go too fast, otherwise we'll have a mass extinction. Uh, so, uh, okay. <laughs> now, Kyra, if you could stay with Emily, if you could stand here, uh, keep up at this mark there where it says Darwin, right? Okay, now boys, your job. So Emily, just keep going to the back of the stage over there. Right till you hit the back of the stage, if you can. So this is this representation then of geological type. Whoop. Can you, uh, Sebastian, can you just hold it somewhere there? That's great. Thank you. This is a representation of, okay, don't disappear, Emily. We need, <laughs> we need you. Oh, it's going to be perfect. Ian, come over here, boyo. Oh, look, it fits exactly. Look at that. How nice. Okay. So this is a representation then of geological time scale. You see, if I, let me give you an imaginary bailout, okay? I'm going to give you an imaginary bailout of $100, $101 bills. How much area of this room would $101 bills cover? You can think about that very easily, okay? Now if I said a million $1 bills, how much area of this room would a million $1 bills cover? Very difficult, right, to estimate that. What about 4,600 million? Is it the area of this campus? Is it Riverside as a whole? Impossible for us to really conceptualize. Okay, so we're going to scale it in a scale that we can understand. So this is 46 feet long. So each one of these one feet is 100 million years, which is the age that physicists estimated the Earth to be at the time that Darwin was living. And he rejected that. He knew that that wasn't long enough. What we're going to talk about in the rest of the talk, then, is two separate real topics. One from Kyra to Emily, we'll talk about later on. And before that, we'll talk about everything from Kyra uh, up towards Ian to, to, to the uh, origin of the Earth, Earth here. And particularly the start of the fossil record, which occurs uh, halfway between Ian and, and Sebastian. So the point that I really want to... Uh, start, uh, start off with, is that the fossil record as Darwin understood it began where Kyra is standing. Where Emily is standing. Emily, could you just put your finger at the end there? Your finger at the end, where Emily's finger is lying across the end, is the amount of time in a, a 46 long uh, toilet paper roll that humans have been on the earth. So this is an we are here for just an incredibly short incident of the entire entirety of the existence of the planet. What a wonderful thing. What a privilege to be here out of this immense history. So, but as far as Darwin was concerned, the first fossils that he recognized were where Kyra is standing. And all the fossil record that was known to him is between Kyra and Emily. So the problem with that, thank you very much, guys. If you could just leave the, 
loop paper on the ground, that'd be great. Thanks. Um, yes. Thank you very much. Give them a clap. Excellent. Okay. So the problem that Darwin had is that the fossil record seemed to him to begin very abruptly at the point where Cairo was standing. And the things that were in the fossil record were not what you would expect according to an evolutionary model from a common ancestor. The sorts of things that were occurring were quite complicated animals and they were organized in ways that are similar to animals that are living today in broad sense. I mean, we could recognize the major groups to which they begin. And there were several different major groups present together. So this was not consistent with the idea of evolution from a single common ancestor. And the sudden appearance of these complicated animals was rather confusing. So Darwin correctly said, there must be a long history of life prior to where Cairo was standing, but we haven't found it yet. And he made various suppositions and, and, and suggestions as to uh, what, how we might go about uh, finding it. So, what I want to do now is to use multiple independent lines of evidence to say what we've learned, and much of it recently here at UCR, in this interval of time from where Cairo was to Sebastian and towards Ian. So the first way in which we're going to think about this is look at the relationships amongst all living groups of organisms. And the fossil record, as Darwin saw it, started sort of down here. The common ancestor of all forms, we think, is going to be way down here. So this was Darwin's problem. These things were the things that were showing up first in the fossil record, not uh, less complex single-celled organisms, which you'd expect down if everything is coming from a single common ancestor. And this is based, this is what we call a phylogenetic tree, and it's based on the genes, uh, the particular structure of the ribosomal RNA. Um, but what we would expect to find as the earliest fossils then is not something like these guys up here, but things with the sorts of characteristics of bacteria or archaea, which are single-celled organisms too. That's the sort of search image we should have. We don't expect to find these guys way back in the geological record. If we do, there's a problem. So let's have uh, a search image then for what we're going to find. OK, so these are the sorts of organisms that are occurring down kind of in these rooting down in this sort of area. They're single-celled organisms. They form chains in this particular type, cyanobacteria. Uh, you can see that the scale is in microns here. They're very small. But although they're very small, fossil, uh, very small uh, organisms, uh, they form structures that you can see at hand specimen scale. Today is my 15th wedding anniversary, and here is a, a picture of my wife, Mary, who is here, <laughs> demonstrating ancient stromatolites, which are built out of those organisms. Uh, and you can see this sort of blue-green color that they have. These um, filaments stitch together clumps, and they trap carbonate sediment, and they build these kinds of structures, which are obviously hand specimen scale. I mean, you can see these things. So this is the sort of thing, not necessarily cyanobacteria. We don't necessarily expect them to be you know, the things that show up, but at least organisms that are organized in this way. So what do we actually find? What does the fossil record discovered in the 150 years since Darwin say about this? Well, these are putatively the earliest fossils known. They're occurring at about 3,400, 3,500 million years ago. And they occur at microscopic scale and also in hand specimen scale. Now, these are not terribly impressive, it must be admitted. They're little sort of smear filament sized things. They're about the right scale and they have hints of divisions in the ones that look really good. These are the best of the lot. Some of them aren't as convincing. On the other hand, over here, you can see in hand specimen scale, laminations running across, and then they come to a nice peaky arch like that. Now, the angle of repose of the grains that are lying on these laminae is too steep for them to just sit there. They'd, they'd fall off unless something is sticking them. What sticks them? Well, we've seen that in the, in the stromatolites that I showed you 20 years ago on the, in, from Australia. So, we're seeing two different types of evidence now for life. One at a microscopic scale, carbon uh, filaments of about the right size. But one at a hand specimen scale that's doing the same sort of thing, slightly different, but doing the same uh, sort of thing. This is the earliest morphological evidence, fossil evidence from the form of organisms for life on the Earth. And it is 
conforming with the basic expectations that we should find. But let's pull in now a completely different style of evidence. And this is work that was published a couple of years ago here from Tim Lyon's lab at UCR. Because as life is evolving, one of the things that we're learning more and more is how intimately life and the environment are connected. So as life evolves and organisms like cyanobacteria that produce free oxygen because they photosynthesize, we should see a change in the composition of the, atmospheres, uh, of the atmosphere and the oceans. And this is a chart then, we'll see several of these. On the horizontal axis is time from the present here to thousands of millions of years. This is 2,500 million years, so the Earth goes on way back there, but we don't have such a good record. And this is the amount of the element molybdenum that is trapped in shale-type rocks. Now, the significance of this is that the trapping of molybdenum is dependent on the amount of oxygen that is freely available. If there is not much oxygen, not much molybdenum is trapped in a shale. But if there is lots of oxygen, it's whoopee time for molybdenum, and lots of it gets trapped in the shale. So what we see here as we go through time from 2,500 million years ago to the origin of the fossil record as Darwin understood it is a rise in oxygen. There are stepwise rises. They're interesting. The causes are debated. We can talk about that later if you're interested. But the basic pattern of a rise in oxygen over this interval is clearly consistent then because with an evolutionary model, because the rise of oxygen, it, the only way that we get free oxygen in the atmosphere is from uh, organic activity because it's so reactive. If there are things uh, producing it, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, reacted away. So another independent style of evidence then is work also done and published this year. Again, all these papers are in Nature and Science, the top journals from our department. And uh, uh, the, uh, this evidence is another totally different kind of, uh, of fossil. This is done by Gordon Love, who's sitting over there. Um, it is a different kind of fossil in the sense that we are not looking at the body of an organism, but we're looking at a particular chemical, a particular organic chemical that is preserved, that is diagnostic of a particular type of organism. So this 24 isopropyl cholestane is a biomolecule that is characteristic of a particular kind of sponges that we know today, the Demo sponges. We find in the ancient record Prior to the origin of the uh, fossil record as Darwin understood it, which was about 520 million years ago, we find a long record of the presence of this specific chemical preceding that, back to 635 in this particular study of Gordon. So that means that these kinds of sponges, or their ancestors, were around at that time. So it's clear evidence, but from a totally different kind of fossil, the fossil of a chemical, rather than the body or the uh, indication of the, uh, the, uh, the oxygen, the geochemical signal. So we're coming now much closer to Kyra. I mean, I've skipped through time. We've, uh, I, haven't got, and I haven't got enough time to talk about um, important things like the evolution of eukaryotes and all these kinds of things. But the basic story is that we're progressing uh, as we go up towards the, the base of the Cambrian, the base of the fossil record, as Darwin understood, we're seeing more complicated organisms. Sponges are, are uh, animals. They've got multiple cell types um, that are differentiated for different functions. So we also, as we get near the base of the fossil record, as Darwin understood it, uh, we get enigmatic fossils that we can now see in hand specimen scale. These are large enough to see. And this thing here was published by Mary, also in science, uh, uh, last year. We don't know what this is. That's 22 uh, 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 centimeters, so this is quite a big thing. You can see it's made of these serially repeating structures. They branch here, and they're attached in this very nice diagram by Mary student Dan Garson um, to the seafloor in these kinds of sucker pads. So we don't know what this animal or plant or whatever it is is, but we think we know what it was doing. And it's sort of interesting. What is, here are the sucker pads, if we see them. And you can see that on this surface, there is one large set of sucker pads, and then over here, a small set. Now, the fact that we've got two sets of distinctly different sizes, and within the classes, they are pretty constant in size, suggests that this animal sent out propagules, it spawned, and then these uh, spat fell down, landed on the, on, the, on the surface, and started a next generation. 
Now, that process of growth almost invariably characterizes sexual reproduction. So although we don't know what animal or plant or whatever it is, multicellular organism, this is, it appears to be an early example, perhaps the earliest example, of sexual reproduction. So Mary wrote this paper up and it went into science. And Iqbal, our friend in the science writer uh, for our college, sent out a press release. And the press release went around the world and there was no interest in America, no interest in India or China or Australia, except for in one country, a country that loves smutty things in newspapers. And that country, of course, is Britain. So, uh, so Mary gets a call from the Times newspaper. Now, you probably know the Times newspaper used to be like the premier newspaper of the world, right? But it's fallen on hard days and now it's become a kind of tabloid newspaper. And so, you know, the idea of the earliest sexual reproduction kind of interested them, and they called up Mary and they talked to her. And Mary had named this fossil after her mother, who comes and does a lot of uh, field work, as our children do, uh, with Mary in the summer. So she called it Phoenicia Dorothea. So they thought, oh, right, we'll better call up uh, Mary's mother. And they said, uh, well, what do you think about having the first organism um, to show sexual reproduction named after you? And... Uh, she said, well, of course I think it's a good thing. I've got 11 grandchildren. So, <laughs> so, but after, after it had gone into the, uh, into the times, you know, I knew uh, what was going to happen. You see, there's a kind of a food chain in British newspapers. And if it goes into the Daily Mail, then there's one ultimate, the ultimate worst newspaper on earth, uh, the, the smutty version of the National Enquirer, sorry, Lisa, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is, uh, is called The Sun. You know, and when it got into the Daily Mail, I knew it was going in the sun. So here it is on the online version of the, of the sun. You know, it's, it's very nice to see uh, my wife's name here along with super babes in the, uh, the, the you can just look here. But you can see that there. But I have to read this line that may not be very clear to you. And I have to read it in the, the accent of the, uh, the editor of the sun. The first creature that did it 570 million years ago, and it was 12 inches long. All right, I love that. Okay. Okay, now there's an immense amount of information about Precambrian life that I, uh, that I haven't told you. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, we could have many lectures on this subject. All sorts of fascinating creatures that existed at that time and just not enough uh, time for us to go through this. But what I want to make the point is, just in recap, if we go from where Ian was standing up there to where Cairo was standing, multiple independent lines of evidence suggest that the earliest organisms were single-celled organisms, and as we move through, they have an effect on the environment around them, and we move towards more complicated organisms, and as we get towards the base of the fossil record as Darwin understood it, we find the progenitors of the, the forms that came later and uh, were responsible for the establishment of the, uh, uh, of the fossil record as Darwin understood it. Okay, now let's uh, take a trip into, this is a representation of that. Don't worry if you can't read this, it's in Danish, unless you happen to be Danish, of course. But, um, but uh, anyway, here's the, the Precambrian time. Here's the advent of the fossil record as Darwin understood it. And one of the things that uh, I want to talk about right now um, is the issue of transitional forms. Uh, people are interested in whether we find fossils that bridge critical divides in evolution. Two weeks ago, David talked about demonstrating natural examples of how quickly evolution can work and uh, of speciation being witnessed before our eyes. But what about major evolutionary transitions? Well, there's a fascinating story. Paleontologists these days are targeting particular places on Earth where they think transitional forms are going to be, and they're finding them. But in the same way as we used independent evidence from multiple lines of reasoning in the understanding of Precambrian life, so we can do the same thing when we approach these sorts of transitional forms. And the first thing I want to discuss is an amazing discovery in genetics in the last 30 years. And that is that the way animals organize their bodies is remarkably similar in different groups of animals. So I don't want to go into this in much detail, but these are a set of genes that are called Hox genes, and here they are arranged along a chromosome. And here is the order of expression in a fly larva 
and in the adult fly. And the point is that the colors, the sequence of colors, is the same in the larva and in the fly and actually on the chromosome. Now these genes, when they're expressed, do not say make a wing specifically. They just say make this region of the body, perhaps the purple region, different from the yellow region or different from the brown region behind it. They're involved in patterning, in setting up the basic organization of the body. Now the amazing thing about these genes is that they are similar not only obviously within an individual, they have to be, but they're being expressed in two different stages. But the genes are incredibly similar between different species, even with wildly different body organization. So the next slide I'm going to show you is um, the amino acid sequence for the business bit of one particular Hox gene in a fly and in various kinds of vertebrates. And the only point I want to make is that the amount of yellow, which is the same amino acids in the same place, is incredible in these two, two diagrams. So here's the sequence, uh, uh, 60 base pairs for a fly. And here it is for a whole load of different kinds of vertebrates, mouse, humans, amphioxus, chicks, etc. They are incredibly similar. They are so similar that we could cut out the protein from the fly, stuff it into the appropriate place in a human, and it would work. Despite 540 million years of evolution, there is this incredible conservation of similarity in the gene even though the product of this, the ultimate product, is as different as a fly and a human. When I think about this, it is just a wonderful thing. I mean, what better evidence of common ancestry can you have that despite these enormous differences, the conservation of the genetic wiring at this level is so high? Now, let's talk about Hox genes in the context of uh, uh, evolution of uh, one of these transitional characteristics. Hox genes are used in basal vertebrates. We're talking about fish evolution here. And we're going to talk particularly about the transition between these kinds of fish and the establishment of life on land in vertebrates with limbs. It's really the fin to limb transition that we're going to talk about. So, it's long been known that there are early land vertebrates that are occurring down about 350 million years ago in the Devonian period. So scientists, paleontologists, decided, well, let's go and find, then, the intermediate forms between these and fishes, between uh, fins and limbs. And they targeted specifically a place to go. Where would you expect that evolutionary transition to occur? Not on top of a mountain, right? Because that's not where fish live. Not in the deep oceans, because that's not where things with limbs live. You'd expect it in the transitional zone between an aquatic uh, and a terrestrial environment. And this is exactly the place. So they specified the time, about 370 million years ago, and they specified the place, that kind of a physical environment that we can tell from the geology. So here it is. And when they did that, lo and behold, they found this, Dictalic, which is uh, really, in characters, halfway between a fish uh, and an amphibian. So this is the head capsule. It's very fish-like, except that the eyes project forward. They're facing forward. And this thing has a neck. It can articulate the head against the rest of the body. Now, fish don't really do that because they're sitting surrounded by water. They don't need to lift their neck up because they're, they're surrounded and moving up and down in this medium. But a thing that's on land needs to push itself up. And so a neck is useful for that, as is a modified fin that can help the thing raise itself up. So we see a coordinated series of transitions in characters that make sense if you're living in that kind of environment. There are early land plants poking up out of the water. You want to nibble those or whatever you're doing, it's a good thing to do. So these kinds of transitions, if we look at the structure of the limb from the fish to the uh, tetrapods that are actually uh, have fully developed limbs, we see this intermediate kind of pattern. And if we look at the uh, uh, development of the head region here, you can see what happens as we move from this form with many ossified bones here, which join the head of the fish to the trunk of the fish. These reduce in thictalic. This bone here, the white one, swings and becomes a support for the limb as the limb needs to uh, perform that function against a hard medium. And other bones like this, which is used in the gill structure of this animal, become modified for a different function. In fact, you are hearing this lecture because this gill branch uh, 
uh, bone here, the hyomandibulum, becomes the stapes, ultimately the second bone in your ear. So the transition here is a morphological transition that makes a graded sense, but it's also sensible in a functional sense. I mean, we can see how these animals work. So we're a, a transition that's occurring in the right place, in the right morphological sequence, in functional sense that works, and also something else. This is the genetics, the developmental genetics, the Hox gene expression of the developing limb in uh, those fish which are most closely related to land vertebrates. And here they are in land vertebrates with limbs, the tetrapods, living ones. Obviously, we can't do the genetics in these forms here, which are all fossil. But you can see that the expansion of this zone of Hox gene expression is occurring presaging this kind of uh, development of the limb. Now, I'm not saying that this is the reason why this limb was able to develop, but nevertheless, it's a parallel expansion that's occurring in this group and uh, maintained in the group that have these limbs. We do have to have the kind of developmental um, abilities uh, or the developmental wiring if we're going to go through this kind of structure. So again, we see an independent uh, patterning here then in the Hox gene expression that is complementing the various other kinds of evidence coming together. Transitional forms, we have them now. It's not just uh, the fins to limbs. Uh, there's a beautiful story about whale evolution and it ties in beautifully with the geological uh, evolution of India. Uh, birds to dinosaurs, sorry, birds, uh, dinosaurs to birds, uh, arthropod evolution, tr tremendous progress in transitional forms because Paleontologists are doing predictive paleontology. They're going to places to find the fossils that are uh, expected to be intermediate, and indeed, we, we find them in those places. So these transitions tend to occur relatively quickly because if you're moving from one environment to another and you transition, and then something builds something, one of your descendants builds an improvement on the, the already um, improved structures you have, you tend to get outcompeted and go extinct. So these kinds of transitions are confined to rare zones in the fossil record. But where we target them, we find them. OK, I'd now like to move on to the last uh, uh, section that I'd like to discuss. Um, and that is just a broad, broad summary of the uh, evolution of life um, from the origin of the fossil record as Darwin understood it. Here's geological time. This time, I'm sorry, it's going from about, actually, this should be 540, about here to the present over here. Here is the number of families. David talked about families two uh, weeks ago, uh, groups of species grouped together. Um, and we can see that diversity is rising from the base of the fossil record as Darwin understood it. This is a slightly old diagram here, but I like it because it has the colors maintained. I'll tell you about what uh, differences we now think between this diagram and a more recent one. A rise in diversity, a kind of a plateau, a very steep drop here, and a rise again. And, and now this rise would sort of level out in more recent uh, analyses. So there are various motifs here. As the rate of origination exceeds the rate of extinction, we increase in diversity. And then we reach a kind of a plateau. But as you'll have noticed, there are places where the rate of extinction exceeds the rate of origination, and we get a drop in diversity. And these can be really quite sudden. These are called mass extinction events. And they punctuate sporadically the history of life on Earth. There's a lot of turnover of species at that time. The main model for extinction that Darwin proposed, competition, is probably driving what's going on in most of these times. But it may not be driving what's going on in most of these mass extinction events, where some kind of physical cause, like the meteorite impact that killed the uh, dinosaurs off at this point here, uh, changed the situation uh, profoundly. And look here, where at this transition, the most profound in Earth history between um, the Permian and the Triassic it's estimated that 96% of species that were living went extinct at that time. After that extinction event, the green group, which was doing well beforehand, becomes subordinate, and a new group expands. So if you're an incumbent, a mass extinction can make you, uh, make you go extinct, and something else uh, can come and take your place. So this is an important message, really, from the fossil record. 
Now, we know that we're living in a time of unprecedented global change. And we also know that we are the cause of this. This is not debated any longer in the scientific literature. So this is rising temperatures from 1900 to 2000. The blue line is natural causes. The red line is natural causes plus anthropogenic causes, our influence. And the black line is what's actually observed. And clearly, global warming is happening, and it's happening because we are making it happen. So that is no longer debated. People are saying, I was listening to the TV a couple of nights ago, and, and uh, somebody was saying, a politician was saying, oh, well, you know, latest dates, results don't, uh, you know, don't think global warming's so bad. Well, what I think this guy was referring to was a comments made by a leading physicist who said, well, you know, if we lived in the Cretaceous period, uh, 100 million years ago, the temperatures were much higher than we expect from global warming. But this is where an understanding of paleontology comes in. Because it's true that many animals and plants were living during the Cretaceous, but we weren't. And many animals and plants that are living in the Cretaceous, very, very few of them are living now. Mass extinctions are really important because it's not so much that life on Earth is going to go extinct. It's just that the key players tend to suffer in mass extinctions, and you can't predict that they're going to be around. I went to San Jacinto High School a few months ago, and I gave a talk, and a very bright student said, yeah, well, we're going to just adapt to, uh, to deal with this. And it's true. We need to adapt to deal with it. But the sorry truth of the fossil record is that most evolving lineages do not adapt to become something else. They go extinct. That's the truth of the, the geological record. And it's important for us to understand that as we face an episode of mass extinction that we are causing, it's sort of, we are causing uh, this mass extinction by competition with other things. But we're really uh, at rates of extinction which are similar to these events that have been so drastic in the past. And I just want to conclude, even as, as, if it, as if that wasn't bad enough, I just want to conclude with a, a, a story that... Uh, takes place in the first place I collected a fossil, um, Robin Hood's Bay in England. This is a sequence of rocks, and geologists do this kind of thing all the time. They measure these sequences, and they make these kinds of diagrams, representations of the sequence. And on this diagram, you can see two wiggly lines. And I just want to draw your attention to these wiggly lines, particularly at this point here. It doesn't really matter what this is, but it is uh, in terms of its, its carbonate content but it is wiggling backwards and forwards, and it's wiggling in a specific way. It has a specific period to it. This is another one of those astronomical cycles. It's not a tide. It's not a solar year. This is a longer scale cycle. This is what's called precession, which is relating to the movement of the Earth's axis with respect to the celestial pole. And it takes place every 26,000 years. So these wiggles here are 26,000 years. These are rocks that are 150 million years old, but what we're seeing is a resolution of rising and falling, and evenly rising and falling, 26,000 years replicated there. So that gives us then a feeling for looking at this trend that is occurring over here. And look what's happening here. This trend, which is carbon isotopes, is going really rapidly from this condition to that condition. Now, since this is 26,000 years, a horizontal line here is a transition in a human lifetime. This is a transition that occurred 150 million years ago, but at a rate within 100 years, a human lifetime kind of transition. Well, what does this represent? This is carbon isotopes. This isn't, these aren't radiogenic carbon isotopes. Um, there are two different types of isotopes of, of carbon um, that uh, have different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. Uh, and life systems are very, very efficient at choosing light carbon. They want to do less work, so they choose the light carbon. So the, the kind of carbon that is entering the sea at this time, entering the oceanic system, is biogenically uh, generated because we have these light signatures. So we're adding very biogenically generated carbon into the system very, very abruptly. So let's use our present being the key to the past to think about how we might do this. Can we find similar sources today? Well, indeed we do. On the continental shelves, seepages from hydrocarbon deposits 
come to the surface, but then they get trapped in what's called methane ice. Here is a methane molecule, biogenically related, light carbon, in a complex with water, forming these kinds of uh, methane ice deposits uh, under the oceans. They also occur in the permafrost. And as we increase global warming, the possibility is that we are going to get to a critical point where these do what they do, which is turn directly from a solid into a gas, sublime as it's called, and add a huge amount of this gas, methane, into the atmosphere. And when they do, they will change carbon isotope signatures, and they will result in huge global warming, because methane is a really serious uh, greenhouse gas. So, in conclusion then, um, we can either uh, just not worry about this, and, uh, oh, well, then, sorry, that's the process of, uh, of uh, sea level rise warming the permafrost and sending these things out. But we can either kind of worry about not pay any attention to this and just sit back and, and have a beer, or we can, we can learn from the past. I mean, for many, many years, people have had different views and totally legitimately had different views on the age of the Earth and uh, a philosophical debate on these issues. But now, for the first time in human history, it really matters. I mean, whether we believe what we're hearing in the fossil record about this change with these clathrates 150 million years ago, and the time scale of that is really important for understanding the kind of threat that we're facing at the moment. If we accept it, we can learn from the past. If we reject it, then it has no relevance to us. This is something that we need to present to uh, children today and to uh, people we're educating at all levels because this really is a decision that has consequences. So ladies and gentlemen, the Earth is experiencing a really uh, dramatic kind of change at the moment. But there's good news. The past has written a record of itself in the rocks beneath our feet and in the genes that have built our bodies. We have evolved eyes to see them. We have modified hyomandibuli in our ears to hear them. This is a change we can believe in. Thank you. Oh, we don't have any mics today, no questions. <laughs> Yes. Well, there were extinctions. Repeat the question. But, uh, so, yes. So, um, the gentleman was asking what happens 150 million years ago in the geological record. So, these rocks are actually very fossiliferous. That's where I collected uh, fossils. And there is a dramatic turnover at each of those in the belemnite fossils that occur in that sequence. So, there is a correspondence. I should have said that. There is a correspondence between those kinds of transitions and the exit of species in the, in the fossil record at that time. Hi. Um, in the um, note for the, from the program, it says um, about the fossil record remains united with one consistent theme, descent with modification. Yeah. In other words, consistent um, with Darwin, Darwin's proposals. Um, what about the Cambrian explosion? Doesn't that show that uh, 600 million years ago that a, a plethora of life forms showed up and they're fully formed, not transitional, so how did, where did they come from? And relatedly, um, the geological column that you showed, does that exist everywhere or anywhere? Where does it exist in its sequence that you showed? Uh, well, there are many, many very complete sections of a large proportion of geological. Oh, sorry. Uh, did everybody get the questions there? Yeah. Um, so the first question is about the completeness of geological sections. So. Um, uh, there are many places where there are extensive records of rock sequences one upon another that extend for a large uh, uh, section of the geological column. There is no one place, as far as I know, where the entire sequence is in uh, continuity because there's a lot of faulting and folding of rocks, a lot of erosion of rocks at, at various times. But, you know, you go out to the Great Basin 
and you can see rocks of every geological um, uh, age in broad stratigraphic succession. You can see how uh, faults have displaced things. You can reconstruct uh, the succession. And so uh, I think there's no difficulty uh, with the idea of uh, establishing long geological sequences. But the point is you can correlate these kinds of fossils around the world and the sequences that we get in individual sections match up with other sections. So there's no difficulty in doing this. It's absolutely standard procedure. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an empirical fact as was recognized before the, um, before the advent of, uh, of evolution. Next question was about um, the um, basically suggesting that the situation is as Darwin uh, indicated it, uh, and that all these fo fossil forms show up preformed uh, at the base of the fossil record. And I think I addressed that uh, in the first part of the talk. I mean, the fact is that we have a long fossil record that extends way back over here, that as we move through that, we see progressively more complex organisms. We see uh, uh, organisms patterned in certain ways that are similar there are, uh, to Cambrian organisms in the immediate time in the rocks that Mary was working on about 570 million years ago. Some of those are putatively members of groups that we see today. We saw Gordon's uh, sponge uh, uh, record in the rocks that preceding that. There is no doubt that the Cambrian explosion is a real thing. Um, there is no doubt that many organisms independently uh, uh, acquired skeletons at that time, which is why the fossil record starts abruptly. Um, but the idea that there is no pre-record of that uh, is just, uh, is just uh, not the case. I mean. Uh, uh, I believe that, that, that some permafrost has already gone, but obviously not the, the, vast, the vast amount of it. So I think there have been cases where in certain places, you have to be in the right place where there's a hydrocarbon seep that is sending this stuff up. But it has, it, they have been recorded on a small scale. The problem is that there's a lot of this stuff that's been accumulating. And um, the, as I understand it, this is not my area of expertise, but the, the permafrost stuff is not the real problem. I mean, there's a lot of gas hydrates in it, but the total volume is relatively small. The problem is the stuff that I showed in the slide there of this material that is uh, under the oceans. And of course, as the oceans get deeper uh, due to global warming, the pressure increases. So in a way, that's counteracting. But the problem is that warmer currents can also uh, unstabilize these things. And that is apparently the real threat. And already, the zone of hypoxia, the zone of no oxygen in the oceans has been expanding quite uh, drastically. And the problem is, you know, do we, you know, okay, we've only risen, you know, one degree centigrade in 100 years. That doesn't seem like so much. But the problem is, do we get to a kind of tipping point and send things over the edge? And that's why we have to study a lot of geology uh, and, uh, and, and, and support that, but also why we have to be very careful about what we do, because we just don't know fully the consequences of these very complicated systems. Daphne. Just ask me, Daphne. Uh. So, what, what the ah, okay, well, um, probably have somebody better qualified to talk about that, but I believe that there's a, there's a, there's a Gordon, uh, you want to say something on that? Um, there's a, a big CO2 hypothesis, and there's a big turnover of... Uh... Um, I, was a, I was actually just going to say that in reference to the comment about uh, methane hydrate sublimating, what the leading hypothesis, as I understand it, is that uh, the Permian extinction was caused in part by a massive uh, sublimation of these methane hydrates caused by the, or the increase in the atmospheric temperature mm -hmm. caused by the Siberian traps. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. 
Yeah, so I think the, the, the Permian uh, mass extinction is, is complicated. It's, it's, I mean, all these events are complicated. So traditionally, the idea has been that all the continents came together at one time. You reduced the amount of area that was available. That created a crisis in the, um, uh, because area available for organisms that were living on the continental shelves decreased. There was this rapid uh, outgassing of the Siberian traps, major volcanic effects. Uh, and when you have a huge amount of injection of material into the atmosphere, that changes the chemistry. But this idea of, of a change in the carbon balance, and uh, what I uh, was thinking of is a, a model with CO2, but the clathrate model may also be appropriate there, um, that there is a, a sort of dramatic knock-on effect, and it's the same kind of thing. It's pushing things over the edge, which really created a combination of the direst circumstances and resulted in this you know, super mass extinction of all, of all time. So these systems are very, very complicated, and you know, people who are working on them spend careers you know, advocating this hypothesis and that hypothesis. And it's probably, in many cases, this sort of feedback system. In fact, in the uh, case of um, the, the situation in North Yorkshire there, it seems like there's a progressive set, set of uh, methane uh, hydrate releases, and the authors of that paper argue for a kind of correlated progression model that you suddenly send these things to one state and then you kick in again and send them over the next. So um, these, uh, these transitions are best avoided if possible. Hello? Hey, James. Are there patterns from the past that in the fossil record that um, might inform us what's going to happen in the future? Well, um, uh, this particular mass extinction is a little bit different than other ones in that um, the causes of the mass extinctions that we've uh, we been talking about are generally some drastic change in the physical environment. This mass extinction is the result of human activity. It's a more sort of Darwinian mass extinction in the sense that it's competition by us with other organisms that's driving them extinct. So we don't have exactly a model for what's happening, except that we are precipitating the kinds of changes in the physical environment, which will have the kinds of changes that we've seen associated with previous mass extinctions. So I think David mentioned in his talk uh, how uh, various organisms are adapting to, uh, uh, to, to the human conditions. So this speciation that's going on in the London Underground and et cetera. Um, so um, uh, that, that kind of a response is, is, is occurring. Um, I don't know that we can uh, make a prediction on um, you know, of who's going to survive here. I mean, obviously, we're an unusual species. But um, I think that the, the, the problem, the possible, I mean, the, the real fear is we're not going to you know, suddenly change the climate and we're just going to go extinct like that. We're going to uh, change the, the situation drastically and societies start to break down and annihilate themselves in other ways. Um, it's, it's a possibility. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, you know, different mass extinctions have had different signatures. Uh, I don't know that we're in a position to predict you know, what kind of mass extinction we're in, particularly as this is a, a particularly unique situation. Okay. Hello. Um, what evidence do you have that the 28 years of the thickening and thinning of the oh, lines yeah. in the sand couldn't happen in 10,000 years in opposed to 100 yes. million years. Yes, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so we, you know, we look for a particular signatures that are as diagnostic as possible. So, yep, um, you know, there could be a cyclicity. Those could be yearly. Um, uh, each sandstone could be a year or it could be, you know, a thousand years or whatever. But how do we, wh why, why do we think it's the best supported hypothesis that these are daily um, uh, uh, deposited in a day? Because the pattern is so completely consistent with a pattern that we observe at the moment, which in, in uh, the, the movement of the moon around the earth, um, which is uh, the thickening and thinning works exactly with a tidal cycle. I mean, the architecture of this fits that particular pattern. Now, we do know other astronomical cycles that take uh, longer, like the 26,000-year cycles, and there are a whole series that are even uh, longer than that. But none of them would yield that particular signature. Plus, the particular characteristics of the sediments, the, the, the sand and the mud, make sense 
in the idea of this migrating dune that's migrating in a, a tidal way. The features that we see in the rocks suggest the, the sorts of features that we see in a tidal environment. So these different combinations of features the very specific 28 cycle with the thickening and thinning in a particular way, the fact that those cycles thin and thicken themselves in relation to the, uh, lunar, to the solar year makes this an extremely strong case. But there is nothing absolutely specific about that to say that, uh, you know, we can't say that we're seeing a day in time in terms of dating radiometrically or something like that. So uh, uh, I'm very confident this is the case because of this particular combination of features. But we, 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 it would be lovely to be able to you know, see uh, individual days in recorded in a series of fossils or something in the clays, but that, that hasn't been preserved for us in this condition. Uh, good evening, Professor. Hello. Uh, you just kind of answered my question, but I just want to do a follow-up. Uh, at the end, you mentioned the global warming. Uh, from my understanding, if I'm not uh, wrong, you can correct me if I am, we have like an ice age every 125,000 years and given that the last ice age was 130,000 years, we are all like overdue for another one. <laughs> so isn't that kind of like arrogance on part of man to think that we can bring about an ice age? Well, uh, well the, 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 you know, when we look at the natural variations in temperature over the last ice ages and when we look at what we are doing to the temperatures at the moment, um, and the variations in the ice core records, we are way exceeding that. So the, um, uh, the, there, is a, uh, there has been a natural cycle and we might be in the middle of an interglacial, but what we're doing to the atmosphere is changing it beyond the conditions that have been seen in these cycles. So we're putting ourselves in a situation which is outside the norm. And I think that is the, uh, um, the reason why we're sort of going beyond the kind of longer term natural variation that we're seeing. And what do you think is the uh, temperature threshold before, you know, we can really kind of, you know, freeze ourselves? Um, how much more can the planet take? What's the threshold for that? Well, we need to do a lot of funding of uh, research in geology to, uh, to answer that question. <laughs> Yeah, don't. Would you say something about the, uh, you were talking about the, the uh, meteor causing mm -hmm. the extinction of the, of the dinosaurs mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, did, did you get the impression that that was something that happened like that? Or what was the time constant for that extinction of the dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that, you know there was a, 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 a. We know that there was an extinction, an impact at the time the dinosaurs were went extinct. Um, it's been located the site, and the effects of it, the splash of, of the material from that uh, meteorite impact, have been spread widely all over the world. Immediately above that, there's a whole series of deposits that indicate uh, global wildfires and a, and a, a just wholly terrible situation that developed there and, and extinctions of organisms on land and in the oceans. Uh, I don't know um, uh, that the chronology of, um, uh, of, the, of the series of effects and how quickly the, um, the particular extinctions took place, but pretty much in, within an order of, you know, of uh, a lot of things would have gone extinct you know, when the seasons were cut out um, by masking of the sky. You know, within a year, years, that, I mean, some instantly and some on a time scale of months to weeks. Most of the extinction would have occurred in, I, I think, in a pretty short sort of period. So certainly on a geological time scale, nothing. Um, uh, probably over a protracted period of several thousands of years, but um, um, uh, a pretty nasty and dramatic event. So that's something we want to avoid too. <laughs> but we can't do so much about that. We can do something about the other stuff. Sorry? I do have that pr pleasure. There are some Permian trilobites yeah, in the Himalayas. Have you collected the Permian trilobites? Uh, uh, no, the, so the gentleman is asking about uh, uh, the fact that trilobites of different ages, trilobites have a geological range, and the ones I collect in the Himalayas have been Cambrian ones, but there are some different types of trilobites that occur in a later sequence of rocks that are called Permian. And um, 
Um, I, the answer is I have not collected any Permian trilobites uh, from the Himalayas as yet, but there are some Philipsia-type trilobites that have been described from near Darjeeling, uh, and uh, I, would love to, uh, I would love to do that. Great. I'm just curious if yeah. the conditions were, if they're, uh, are they found partial or complete? Or There are some complete specimens, yeah. Um, uh, I've forgotten. There's a paper in the Geological Society of India bulletin by... Sorry, forgotten. But it is a, it's a complete specimen, um, published about 20 years ago. Yeah. So sometime you might do that, collect... Yeah, I'll Permian. have to do that. I'll have to do that. I'll Great. send Ryan to do it. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, should we take one more question? I see one hand back there. Should we take one more question? And then I think we should let this poor guy sit down for a few minutes. <laughs> Uh, are there models for that, did you say? Yeah. Um, I'm sure there are. I'm afraid I know nothing about that. Um. Okay, well, please join me in thanking <laughs> Nigel for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. We'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>